Welcome back, pet parents. So if your dog or cat is sick in some way, you keep going back to the veterinarian. You're, you're, you're doing everything. Your veterinarian is telling you to, and you feel like you're just not making any headway. Like you're going and you're going, you're doing all the things, you're spending so much money, but your dog or your cat just isn't getting better. I'd be willing to bet you need to look at their gut health. That's something that our veterinarians just aren't really well versed in. Some of them are going out and getting additional education to learn about it. And one of the companies that is providing this education to our veterinarians is Animal Biome. That's why I'm so excited to have Carlton Osborne with us today. He is the co-founder and CEO of Animal Biome. And as soon as I met him at Super Zoo, I knew he was going to be perfect for the podcast because he is upbeat and bubbly and has just a wonderful bursting personality. So Carlton, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you, Jessica. And what kind words. I'm really excited to be here today as well. Yeah. So I have been familiar with Animal Biome for a couple of years, but I think there's still a pretty big portion of the population that may not be very familiar with it. And what I'd really like to just start out to kind of get people like dip their toes in, if you had to explain to just the average pet parent what Animal Biome is, what is it? Okay. So I think the first thing people need to know is that this paradigm where we or our pets eat things and we digest them and that's how we get the nutrients we need, that paradigm is actually old. The reality is we now know that when we eat things, there are bacteria and other microbes in our guts that actually digest the, the food and then produce the compounds that help us be healthy. And so what us and our pets, and so what Animal Biome does is we look at the community of bacteria in the gut of your cat or dog and then let you know whether that community is healthy. And if not, what you can do to um, restore balance to your pet's microbiome. And so the way we do this is that we have a test. You send us in a little bit of poop in a tube, and then we do really high-tech um, sequencing and look at all the DNA of all the bacteria in the poop and then compare it to our healthy reference. And we'll make dietary or supplement recommendations to adjust your pet's microbiome. Yeah, so I find this super interesting because, well, for lots of reasons. And I want to throw in just a quick, like, personal story, and hopefully people can relate to it. I have tested two of my cats and my dog, and I've actually tested my dog twice. And it's the craziest thing. My cats have somehow quote unquote balanced microbiomes, my dog just never has had a balanced microbiome. And I actually do so much more for my dog. But one thing I have found out, um, and I think it was through the state of the gut report, and it was mm -hmm. a possibly a live that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, your wife, Holly? <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And um, Dr. Odette Suter did is that a lot of raw fed dogs actually don't have balanced microbiomes, gut microbiomes. And one of the things I found out is because I don't want to say all, but a lot of raw fed dogs may not be getting enough fiber in their diet. Yeah, um, so right. most recently, I, I so I tested her gut microbiome in January of this year. Mm -hmm. And it came back that it wasn't balanced. And I was going to do, I, but this was before the green juju challenge. Literally, uh -huh. I, and, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. I, I literally went out as soon as, like the day I got her microbiome back, I called my friend who owns my local healthy pet food store. And I said, buy me all the green juju, <laughs> order it all for me. Because at the time she didn't stock it. And so she ordered all the green juju for me and I started feeding it to my dog, but life happened and I didn't retest, yada, yada. And I fell off. She also went through some some food aversion issues, yeah, all the things. Okay. So I tested her again, and so this is if if you're watching the video, if you're if you're not, no worries. This is the doggy biome kit. I tested her again, and I literally just today, the day we are recording this, got the results back, and um, her gut is still <laughs> imbalanced. <laughs> and um, I I had already started the green juju challenge, so this is the box for the. 
the green yeah. juju gut microbiome challenge. So we have been doing pretty good. She has been eating her veggies, which I am oh. shocked. She is not a veggie eater. She will like push and pro if it is not like really, really mixed in, she is going mm -hmm. to avoiding her veggies at all costs. Um, so we've been doing pretty good. Fingers crossed that we, we see some really great improvements with the green juju challenge. <laughs> but That's great. That's great. Well, thank you for being a customer, Jessica. <laughs> of course, but there are so many more things. So the testing is, is one part. And mm -hmm. I think for pet parents, it could, you know, hopefully you can work with your veterinarian and they can help you through with all of the results of the testing. Animal mm -hmm. Biome will offer a free, I think, what is it? 15 minute consultation. 15 minute consult. That's right. Which is awesome. I actually did that the first time around because I was like, um, like I get it, but I don't get it. Can you just help me out mm -hmm. a little bit? And I think that's wonderful for yep. pet parents who, whether their veterinarian just doesn't know anything about this and is like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't help you, or they don't have sadly a veterinarian they feel like they can trust and talk to about it. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. all of those situations happen. Yep. Um, and then of course there are other, you know, pet health coaches and things like that who can help you through the process. But how did you and Holly, how did, how did y'all decide to start this? Yeah, so it's a, um, I think like a lot of uh, companies in the pet space, it really starts with a personal story. So we had this dog named Yuki. She was our first fur child. And um, she was 13. She was a herding dog, a California herding dog called McNabb Shepherd. And, um, and one day, we could feed her anything. We were really bad pet parents. We fed her crap, okay? And then one day she came down with something called hemorrhagic gastroenteritis which is basically bloody diarrhea. And we rushed her to the emergency room. We really thought we were going to lose it. And they stabilized her with fluids and antibiotics. And um, I happened to take the call from the vet when she was being discharged. And I said, well, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And the vet said, well, Yuki had an overgrowth of bad bacteria. And I'm thinking, my wife is a microbiologist. I'm going to have to explain a little bit more than that to her. So I asked question after question, and really, my vet couldn't explain it. And unfortunately, every two or three weeks, she'd eat something. We, The wind would blow the wrong way, and she'd have blowout diarrhea. And um, meanwhile, my Holly was doing um, – so she's a PhD microbiologist, and she got her PhD from UC Davis. And when Yuki had this problem, she was working at UC Berkeley – looking at the soil microbiome in Southern Africa. And um, she realized that the tools that she was using, the analysis that she was using could be applied to companion animals and that maybe she could help pets like Yuki. And so she took a research position at UC Davis vet school and at the UC Davis Genome Center. And back in 2015, she launched something called the Kitty Biome Project, which was the first attempt to describe the gut microbiome of cats. And we had about 350, 400 cats returned samples or pet parents returned samples. And, um, and it was really clear that pets that had chronic GI problems, their microbiomes were really different than healthy cats. And when Holly dove deeper and looked at, you know, what were the drivers of this difference? The number one cause was exposure to antibiotics. And because what happens with antibiotics, you know, there are times when they have to get used but they're what's called non-target effects. So they go in, they kill what the vet wants them to kill, but then they also kill a lot of healthy bacteria. And so, um, so Holly sort of thought through, well, how can we restore the microbiome? And she developed what we now call the animal biome microbiome restoration therapy. And, um, and Yuki was dog patient zero for that. And from basically after one round of, um, the fecal transplant capsules. Yuki had nice firm poop and she lived another four years and had perfect poop until she died. So, wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. So that's how we got into this. And, um, and really it's um, now that we've been in, doing this since 2016, we've test, we have the largest database of cat and dog microbiome samples in the world. And we really see three trends going on. And I want to get back to talk about your dog a little bit because like the most common thing we see is that the pets have the right bacteria, but in the wrong proportions. And often we can address that with diet. And that's, 
that's typically when we recommend fiber or protein, it's because they, they're, they're imbalanced. And we think that the fiber can promote the growth of some of the beneficial bacteria. Um, and so I'm just curious, was your pet, was your dog experiencing any symptoms or were you just uh, curious about what the microbiome looked like? I'd say I was just curious. I okay. mean, every okay. once in a while she'll have a little, you know, upset tummy. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and you know, me being just human, trying to rationalize everything, right. I think it's because of the like cooked meat treats that she, you know, my husband sneaks her all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, it could very well be. But often what we find is that when a pet's microbiome is out of balance, they become much more sensitive. And so whether it's the cooked treat, whether it's, um, uh, they do a dental and they have to get Clavamox or something like that, they're much more likely to end up in a sick state because of that imbalance. So even though your dog wasn't regularly exhibiting any GI distress, um, it sounds like, like, like he might be just a little bit more sensitive. And, um, and so working on getting the right balance will help him not be as sensitive. Right. So what is it about the gut microbiome? Like it, that's, it, everybody's talking about it, right? Whether mm -hmm. we're talking about humans or pets, like everybody is talking about the gut and mm -hmm. like, so why, why is everybody talking about the gut? Okay. So, um, if you go to a holistic veterinarian or doctor, they will tell you that, um, Chinese medicine, Arabic medicine, they've been talking about the gut for thousands of years. The reason why they're talking about the microbiome now is because the technology is fairly new to be able to describe the bacteria in the gut. And so when we first started, it was very expensive to sequence or do uh, genomic sequencing of the bacteria and the price has come down quite a bit. But, um, but so that technology has unlocked all of this data. And then, I mean, my background is more uh, computers than it is biology, but really computers and biology have come together because now we can understand at the um, DNA level what is in the gut. And then we use computer science and bioinformatics to analyze it and to understand what it should be and how you can adjust it. So I would say, I mean, I think Hippocrates more than 2,500 years ago said that all disease starts in the gut. So gut health has been an important thing, but I think the technology we have now has really created this microbiome field and that's why everyone's talking about it. Yeah, I can, I can totally see that. It's like, I think we got to a point in, in society where it was like, if we couldn't prove it on paper, it didn't exist yeah. <laughs> anymore. So we had to be able to prove it on paper again. Yep. And you know, what's interesting. So we have about a thousand vets that work with us and they, they, um, give their clients the microbiome test and provide some of our supplements and the vets that adopted us first were their holistic vets that realized that the microbiome really described everything they already believed or the internal medicine specialists that were looking for better ways of addressing these chronic problems in cats and dogs. And they're, they're a little bit more tech forward. And so those two sides of the spectrum. Um, and so we still have another, what, 40,000 clinics to uh, get that out, out there and educate, but we're making a, a good start at it. Oh, for sure. Yes. And, you know, the price point on the kit, I think is really great too. I, I think most anybody, especially somebody who really has been working through, like they have a sick dog and they're trying everything and they're doing everything and they're doing all the, all these different testing and like nothing seems to be happening. This is, this is like a drop in the bucket. This is not an expensive thing anymore. Like you were saying, um, it's That's accessible right. to everyone. And also really what we're doing is we're bringing a different approach to thinking about how to decide what food or supplements to give your pet. So the most common approach is trial and error. I'll try this diet. I'll try this supplement. And sometimes you don't know if it's working. Sometimes it works a little bit. And then, but you don't really, it's all like guess, guesswork. And so the idea behind the microbiome test is that we're giving you an objective result 
And then we're using all the data we have to say, well, typically microbiomes like this are associated with GI or skin problems. And if you do X, your probability of a good outcome is higher. So you can go sort of the trial and error route with us and just try one of our supplements. But if you start with the test, you're much more likely to have a, a positive result. Right. Um, that makes so much sense. So talking about your supplements, because you have a, a, a few, like you're, mm -hmm. it's not crazy. You have a few, uh -huh. right? And yeah. I think they're like super, super targeted to probably what you're seeing animals need through the testing right. that you've done. Um, before we talk a little bit about your supplements, can you tell me the difference and tell our audience mm -hmm. the difference in a prebiotic probiotic and a postbiotic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I don't have it here, but we sometimes use a visual of Ms. Pac-Man. Okay. Okay. So if you've ever played Ms. Pac-Man, um, the little uh, lady eats like cherries and other things. The, the cherries are the prebiotics. It's the thing that the Pac-Man, Pac, Ms. Pac-Woman is the probiotic, eats prebiotics and then produces compounds, beneficial compounds called postbiotics. And so um, when I said earlier that really it's the bacteria that digest our food, mm -hmm. those are the bacteria that are, whether you're eating, you know, protein or, or green juju, the bacteria are digesting that food and then producing beneficial compounds. And those are the postbiotics. And so initially we really focused on prebiotics because most of the probiotics on the market, the bacteria that are in them, aren't the ones that Holly was seeing pets need. And so when you look at healthy pets, they have about 25 groups of bacteria that they all seem to have. And when they get exposed to antibiotics, they tend to lose three or more of them. And the ones they lose aren't in today's probiotics. Mm. Um, and so so we were focused on what can you feed the bacteria to have the healthy ones produce more. And over time, we've identified different probiotics that, that we see do have an effect in the microbiome. But sometimes when you have a pet that like Yuki ended up getting um, uh, pancreatic cancer in the end. And so her digestive system was not working at that point. And so when you have a microbiome that, that basically is being disrupted because of disease, Sometimes the postbiotic can sort of skip the line and just give them exactly what they need. And so that they're really three important tools for managing your pet's gut. Okay. So in this supplement line that Animal Biome has mm -hmm. created, we have some of these prebiotics, probiotics, postbiotics. Postbiotics, <laughs> yep, yep. And um, I like it as a tongue twister for me. So I have to yes, slow down. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they are very, like we were, you were just saying, very targeted for what, because you have this database of gut reporting in dogs and cats, mm -hmm. you're not just saying, well, we know that, you know, this exists in nature and it's wonderful. And, you know, all these research studies show how wonderful it is. So we're going to give this to our animals. Instead, we're saying this is what should be. This is what exists in a healthy animal's gut microbiome. This is what we're seeing most often not being there or not being there in the right proportions. So that is how you're making your supplements. That's right. And so okay. more specifically, so there are two key trends that we see in the microbiome. First is your pet does not have the bacteria that healthy pets have. And like I said, that even, even, so when Holly first started in 2016, she realized that the only way to get those bacteria from, from the healthy pet, um, because they weren't in probiotics is through a fecal transplant. And so she developed a way to deliver a fecal transplant in a capsule. And so the capsules that we have, we really resisted calling them uh, probiotics because they have thousands of different strains of bacteria. And so we call them probiotics um, <laughs> because literally it is poop from a healthy cat or dog that we screen for pathogens and parasites. And today that's the only way to get that complement 
of bacteria that your pet is going to lose if they get exposed to antibiotics or through some other disruption. Um, the other thing we see is that many pets have high levels of E. coli, and there are some probiotics that outcompete E. coli, but we identified a prebiotic that actually goes in and targets E. coli. And so we created this product called Gut Maintenance Plus, and it has four different prebiotics in it. They're called bacteriophages. They're viruses that specifically target E. coli. And so if you're, if you do a test and your dog comes back as having high E. coli, we say use gut maintenance plus. If you do the test and it comes back as says missing beneficial microbes, we say do the fecal transplant, gut restore. Sometimes they come back with both and you need both. And so early on, we did a study with the fecal transplant capsules and 80% of the pets showed an improvement in their clinical signs. These are pets with IBD. Okay. And then, you know, Holly, because she wants perfection, started looking at the 20% that it didn't work on and then started to look at the ones that regressed over two or four months. And what she saw was those pets also had high E. coli. So they were missing key microbes and they had high E. coli. So the test tells you where your pet fits into this, this, uh, these groupings. Do they just need to change their diet? Do they need beneficial microbes, or do they need um, uh, this to get rid of the E. coli? And then based on that, that's those are the supplements you recommend. And so if you were just doing trial and error, you might try the gut restore, but if your pet has high E. coli, it's not going to, it's going to work a little bit, but it's going to come back. If you do the high, the gut maintenance plus for high E. coli, but actually they're missing beneficial microbes, then it's not going to work either. So that's why the trial and error is so challenging. It's better to start with a test and then know what you should do. Yeah, absolutely. So with the um, fecal capsules that uh-huh. animal Micro-bag- biome create, yeah. Yep. so yes, I find so many people are just put off by by, by the idea of handling poop Mm -hmm. by the idea of feeding poop to their animals. Um, To me, I'm a crazy person. So I'm just like, sure, this is totally normal. I have no problem doing this. (laughs) Um, But I, and I really didn't think much about it until I was, I was giving uh, one of my cats, some of the FMT capsules. And when I was giving my pet sitter instruction she was like i'm sorry you want me to do what (laughs) yeah i'm like it's a tiny little capsule like no like just put it in the food she'll eat it right out of your hand like wash your hands you're good right but no apparently this is a thing (laughs) (laughs) so it it turns out it turned go ahead no it's a thing you know having it in the capsule still I, again, it makes it so much more accessible for people. That's right. That's right. So it turns out that fecal transplants actually go back 2,000 years in traditional Chinese medicine. And there's documented uh, use of it in large animal medicine four or 500 years ago. And then in World War II, um, soldiers were basically told to eat camel dung to um, solve their dysentery. It, this is in North Africa. And so um, healers have known there's something useful in poop for a long time, but they didn't know what it was. And also, they didn't have the tools we have today to make sure they weren't passing on disease. And so it does sound really weird. But when Holly was looking at pets that had the problem that Yuki had, she was like, they need Fusu bacteria. You can't get that in a probiotic. They need bacteroides. That is not available in a probiotic. And so it is available from healthy poop. And so we really take um, really extraordinary efforts to make sure that we're only getting the cleanest, best poop possible. So we screen, this year, we've screened over a thousand cats and dogs to be donors in our program, and fewer than 2% actually make the grade. And then they only stay in the program for like six or 12 months typically because they get exposed to like Giardia is like one of our big 
uh, enemies in the in the dog community. Once they get Giardia, and they have to get treated if they have symptoms, the pet, the vet's going to give them antibiotics, and that that dog is never going to be as healthy as they were before. So we have to basically push them out of the program. And then with cats, it's feline coronavirus. Like mm-hmm. that is just a really prevalent and uh, insidious pathogen that once a cat gets that, they can't be donors either. And so, um, so yeah, it just sounds a little weird, but, um, but they actually still do it in humans um, wh- who have C. diff infections. So these are antibiotic resistant uh, infections of C. difficile and it's life-threatening. And often you get it in the hospital. So you may go in for one thing and then end up getting this bug in the hospital. And mm-hmm. the only thing that works is a fecal transplant. And so, um, so if you talk to like a gerion, uh, gastroenterologist in the, in the U.S., they're like, oh, yeah, we do fecal transplants all the time. Um, but it's still considered somewhat unusual. Um, uh, and so it's, you know, our goal. So like what Holly is doing back in the lab is she has a whole team of people figuring out what's inside the fecal transplant, isolating it, and then we're going to make those the next generation of probiotics. Awesome. Well, that is, I, I'm just so excited for where this is going because it I really, truly is making such a difference in, I mean, cats' lives too, but I really see it very significantly in, in dog dogs' lives because our traditional, you know, veterinary practice just, I mean, we we're just putting band-aids on symptoms here, right? <laughs> and yeah. our dogs never really get better. And if we can attack the root of what is actually wrong, where that imbalance is inside of the body, then we can actually allow the body to do what it's supposed to do and heal itself. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled with what you guys are doing and how, again, how accessible and affordable all of this is. Um, and I, I will say every time, literally every time it it is stuck in my brain, it is seared in my brain, Dr. Odette Suter, who I know you're very, very intimately familiar with. She's, um, very vocal about all the wonderful things Animal Biome is doing. And she has been on the podcast as well. She posted a picture. It had to have been at least a year ago. She was at an airport in the bathroom at the airport and she took a selfie and she was like, she said, I'm getting my fecal transplant at the airport. <laughs> Literally every, every time I walk into an airport bathroom, that's all I can think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed that post. Um, she's, she's, uh, she's, she's a wonderful person. And, um, and she's been a great advisor to us over, over the years. And, um, and yeah, so she's, she will sometimes like be very provocative because this sort of, um, conventional approach for caring for cats and dogs, it's just so easy. You can go anywhere and get food that that's very convenient, but that doesn't mean it's good for your pet. Right. And you can go anywhere and like get supplements, but those, that doesn't mean it's the right ones. And so she's, she sometimes has a little bit of a, uh, tries to be provocative to get people out of their rut, right? Mm-hmm. Because, um, you know, they're, most vets weren't taught about this in vet school. Um, but I did, I mentioned that we have uh, over a thousand vets that, um, you know, believe in microbiome medicine, and we actually have a vet finder on our website. And so if your vet isn't, if you ask them, what do you think about microbiome medicine? And they give you a blank look, you can go to our website to find a vet that really believes in it. That's wonderful. I actually, I don't know how I didn't know that, but thank you for bringing that up uh, sure. because it is, yeah, I think, and it could be just another one of those tools where like people are, I, I'm struggling with my vet and I need to find a new vet. Like, where can I go? as another tool. Yeah. Like, hmm, maybe if they're on this website, <laughs> They would be, exactly. they would be good for you. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's so much more work. There's so much, so much else that out there, like that we know is out there, but we don't know what it is yet. And I'm so glad there are people like you and Holly who are, who are working on it and, um, helping us help our pets do better. Um, thank you for sharing your story because I think that helps us put ourselves in other people's shoes and and understand a little bit better because there are so many dogs suffering right now 
Um, mm -hmm. Sadly, probably very unnecessarily just because they're not getting the proper diagnostics and treatment um, because the, our veterinarians just don't know. So um, if you're listening and you're interested, like bring it up to your veterinarian. Like I, I am a big advocate for just having open, honest, like talk to your veterinarian like they're a person because they are and mm -hmm. introduce the idea to them. Maybe they're not going to do anything with it and they're going to shrug you off, but maybe they'll look into it and they'll be like, hmm, let me give this a try and see what it's all about and, you know, give them the opportunity to, to learn more and to add another tool to their toolbox. And yeah, just so excited. Yeah, for absolutely. It. Well, thank you. Thank you. And just, um, so we have a, a, a vet specific website, animalbiome.vet. And so, you know, if your vet wants to learn more, we have research papers there. We have webinar CE, uh, continuing education webinars. And, and that's where you'll find our vet finder. Um, on that on that website, so encourage you to take a look and also send your vet there. Um, and today, many of the products we sell are available on both vet and our consumer sites. But I will say, like, if you have a pet that has had a chronic problem, finding a vet that can help you manage that problem and think about the microbiome in the context of everything else that they're doing is really essential. Because you know we provide these fifteen minute consultations. But like we don't know your whole, your pet's whole history, right? And so, um, if your you know your pet has CKD or hyperthyroid, like those special conditions, your vet should be the one guiding you through the microbiome supplements and microbiome medicine. Um, and so, finding one that works for you and understands that is important. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because I you know and I talk about that a lot on the podcast is individualized medicine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think so many of us have kind of been programmed out of thinking that way uh, because that's just not how we get our medicine anymore. Like we don't get individualized medicine anymore yeah. and we should. I mean, that's yeah. really the most effective uh, way and, and, and empowering, I think, like because we have so much, so much more control than we think we do. We can do so much. To heal ourselves and yeah. we have the same responsibility with with our pets but it is all That's right. about individualized medicine it is an advocacy right like um you know because you know let's face it we don't have enough vets in america to serve all the pets we have the way they need to be served and so often a vet may have 10 or fewer minutes to like figure out what to do with your sick pet and um and so it's like, it's incumbent on us as pet parents to be their advocate, to question, to learn. And so that, um, you know, the vet's not just playing the odds and giving the average uh, treatment plan, but the treatment plan your pet needs. And so I think that's really important to communicate to your listeners. Carlton, thank you so much for jumping back on with me. I appreciate you sure. more than you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> I wanted to get this episode out before Thriving Pet uh, because I know you guys uh -huh. are going to be there. And in the healthy pet community in the past couple of days, some people have brought up something about animal biome. And I wanted, I don't want to be a, judgmental at all whatsoever. That's not my goal here. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about it, discuss it, because I think First of all, one of the reasons why there are certain companies and brands that I love so much is because of their transparency. And I think that's something that Animal Biome wants to do as well. Um, so I wanted okay. to give you the opportunity. And there is, there's just a picture of a, a screenshot of the partner's page of your website floating around. And this is, of course, mm -hmm. y'all are being transparent, right? Um, and it shows that some of your partners are Cargill for which, you know, if those of you don't know, that's Purina, Hill Science Diet. Um, and then at the bottom, some Royal Canin. Of course, there were other partners as well. But I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about that because, I mean, it's just the world we live in, right? So I wanted to give you that platform. Yeah, sure. And And it's actually, I mean... So when we think about like what we're trying to do at Animal Biome, it is really about 
improving the health of all animals. And the problem that we have as an industry community is that um, people have been making pet food, they've been making pet supplements, and they have been caring for pets without regard to the impact of that care on the pet's microbiome, okay? And so part of our mission is to um, help individual pets, but we really wanna help all pets, okay? And so half of all vet visits relate to problems that whose root is the gut microbiome. And so I recognize that as a small company, we're not gonna be able to sell our tests and our products to every pet parent in the world. Right. And so in order to help the most pets possible, what we've done is that we enable pet food and supplement companies to access our expertise, to better understand how their food or products affect a pet's microbiome. So we've done over 45 studies with leading pet food companies, leading pet supplement companies, small pet treat companies that we often do for free and also nonprofits and academics institutions, because what we've done is we've pulled in, you know, starting with Holly, but we've pulled in PhDs um, from human microbiome, uh, koala microbiome, all, all the experts on the microbiome throughout sort of um, industry, you know, academia. And we have 10 of those folks on our staff. And so we make, those folks available to any company that wants to better understand how their food or pet or supplement affects the microbiome. And so we do research on our own products. We also do research on our, our partner's products. So when we say we partner with a Cargill or a Hills, they're essentially working with us to understand how their products affect the microbiome. And so, um, whether you know someone believes in feeding raw or feeding kibble or feeding uh, vegan, um, all those things matter to the microbiome. And having the people who are putting those products in the market better understand how their how their products affect the gut microbiome, that's all really important so that they can improve their products. So we did a study, an example of this. We did a study with um, with one pet food company, and they wanted to see how their, their food compared to uh, their nearest competitor in terms of how it affected the microbiome. And it turned out that their food did not do as well in nurturing the microbiome as their nearest competitor. And um, their R&D team went back to the drawing board to think about how they could improve their food based on the data that we helped them generate. And so I think it would be short-sighted to say, well, we're only going to work with certain companies and they're we're only going to let them know how their products affect the microbiome. Cause that means the pet parents who buy those other companies are going to suffer. Their pets are going to suffer. So we really believe in open access and transparency. And we believe that more data is good for the whole industry. And so, um, so that's, that's why we partner with anyone who really wants to know and is willing to invest in understanding how their products affect the microbiome. I, I think that is so important um, because as I was preparing to talk to you again today, I, I was just mm -hmm. thinking, and you know, I, I'm sure I have been guilty of this in the past, especially like as a new raw feeder, I was very like, no, this is the way to go. And I have to make sure everybody gets on board with this. <laughs> and the reality is, and I think, you know, we kind of settle into this place where it's like, yeah, I want to help people do better for their pets. But the reality of the world we live in, the situation that most people are in today, still over 90% of, you know, U.S. households with pets are feeding kibble. And mm -hmm. would we love to change that? Probably. <laughs> Probably. But in the interim, in the meantime, is there a way where we can still help these pet parents, where we can we can try to hopefully help these larger companies that we can sometimes vilify. And I know I'm guilty of that as well. I'm not going to lie. 
Um, sometimes mm -hmm. vilify. I mean, the reality is they are corporations, which means that everything comes down to a bottom line um, dollar figure for a corporation generally, but especially when that large with so many, you know, they're, they're probably mostly owned, not even by people anymore, but by, you know, a bunch of uh, investment firms. But anyway, um, that's a whole other story. But to be able to figure out how to bring the best possible products and services to as many people as possible, we have to be able to consider kibble, kibble feeders, kibble companies, people that, you know, advocate for, for kibble diets. We have to be able to do that. And um, so uh, thank you. I, I wanted, again, just to kind of give you that platform and under, and hopefully understand a little bit better that like partners, you know, and what that actually means for animal mm -hmm. biome. So you're working, you're, you're actually like there's research going on in partnership with That's these right. companies. It's not necessarily that they're like funding you to make products saying, you know, well, we're funding this product, so you need to make it the way we want. No, no, that's right. And so, um, so we, we do have funding from Cargill. Um, they are one of our research partners, both looking at their products, but also helping us develop that next generation of probiotics. Because I, I think I mentioned when we spoke before, one of the most common problems we see is that sick pets are missing the bacteria that healthy pets have. And mm -hmm. the only way that they can get them today is through a fecal transplant. And fecal transplants, honestly, it's a labor of love. It's hard to have a stool bank. It's expensive. And there are a lot of people who can't afford our products, even though their pets need them. And so what Holly and her team have realized is that um, they're really a handful of bacteria that if we can figure out that are health in healthy pets, if we can figure out how to manufacture them, then all of the, I won't say all the probiotics on the market today are useless, but the vast majority of them are, the, are not the ones that pets need. And so we envision a world where like, you know, if a pet needs a particular bacteria, you can go into a store and get it. Um, versus where we are now, where you're giving them a bacteria from soil or from um, a human baby, and it's not the right one they need. So you're going to give it to them, and you're going to have to keep giving it every day, and it's not going to solve the underlying problem. And so that's one of the two big projects that we're working on with Cargill is looking at that next generation. And, you know, it may be five or ten years before we have those products where we want, want them to be. But, um, but you know... Again, they're pets suffering every day because they're missing these bacteria. And I'd love it if all of them bought, if their pet parents bought a fecal transplant and fixed the problem. But honestly, we don't even have enough product to um, meet the demand we currently have. So I know that like this solution is a temporary solution. We have to come up with a better way. That's what we're working on with Cargill. And, you know, I we, Holly and I both come from outside of pet food, animal health. and um, and I, I understand how easy it is to um, assume the worst about everyone who works at these large companies. Um, but I think part of what people need to think about is that um, it's like we've seen the light and there are a lot of people who haven't, right? And um, it's not that their hearts are in the wrong place. It's just that they haven't come to the understanding that we've come to. And part of our job is to get them to come to that understanding. And yeah, it's less than 10% of the market is currently like raw or probably even fresh cooked. And so we have a lot of work to do. And for us, from our perspective, it's really the data that will help everyone understand how, how to better care for cats and dogs. And we can help them generate that data and generate that understanding. Um, but yeah, so that's how, how we think about partners and why we partner and like, for us, like the partners we don't want are the ones that just want to use a study to justify, to like as a sort of marketing gimmick, and then they're not going to change the food for the better. And so we've had partners like that in the past. We've learned from that. And that's one of the key things that we ask when we're going to, you know, uh, take on a partner. It's like, okay, so if the study finds that your competitor's food is better than yours for the microbiome. What are you going to do about it? Well, 
if you're going to make your food better, then we'll work with you. If you're like, well, we'll look at some other metric and sell on that one. Then that's not, right. we're not the right partner for you. Okay. That makes sense. And again, you know, I, I appreciate you being like open and honest about it. Um, because again, yeah, it, it is this like, this balancing act of like, guess who has the money <laughs> and we need to do research <laughs> um, and research is expensive. So um, if yes. you can do that in the, the best way possible in, in vetting, you know, like you just said, what are the actual intentions that you have and how can we use this information to make pet food better? Um, yep. I think in the world we currently live in, that's probably the best case scenario. Yeah, yeah. it is. And, and I don't know. I mean, you know, we feed our, our dogs raw and fresh cooked. My 16 year old is on the fresh cooked. Um, but our first dog, like we fed her kibble. We didn't know. Um, and, and, you know, our dogs are going to hopefully live better, fuller lives because we're feeding them better. So that's like a personal choice we're making. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Not everyone knows they should make that choice. Not everyone feels as though they can afford it. Um, and it's still important that their pets are well cared for, even if they don't fully understand how their food is made or why one food might be better. That's so profound, actually, because <laughs> we don't often think, and I know that most of, most of the people that listen, you know, my audience are a little bit more educated and understand a little mm -hmm. bit better about how to care for their pets. So it can be, it can be difficult and we can forget that the vast majority of people that we encounter have no idea what we're talking about and truly mm -hmm. honestly think I am feeding the best food to my dog. Like this is it. This is what my vet said. This is blah, blah, blah. And, um, we can forget that sometimes that, and we were once there. I know I, I'm right there with you. I was once there mm -hmm. too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Another question that I kind of, I, people aren't necessarily asking this question. I'm just seeing like there's a handful of people saying yes, and there's a handful of people saying no. So there seems to be conflict about is Dr. Margot Roman still providing her raw fed dogs stool to Animal Biome as a like, uh, you know, veterinary prescription FMT capsule? <laughs> Yes, she is. And, um, and we're going to, and like, you know, she's been a really great partner of ours. Um, from the very beginning, our first AHVMA, um, she's, she's like the godmother of fecal transplants. Right. And, um, at least, um, in modern times, I guess. And, um, yeah. and so she's been a great, great partner of ours. And, um, and I guess it was about a year ago, she started supplying, uh, fecal material from her, her pets, her dogs. And so one of the things we have found is that partly because of where we are based, it's been very hard for us to maintain a supply of raw donors. Um, if you live in a city, your dogs are exposed to a lot more than if you live in the country. And if they're in the country, they're exposed to different things than if they live in the city. What we have found, particularly in California, Giardia is really rampant. And so if any pet, any dog gets Giardia, the vast majority of vets will treat that dog with antibiotics and then they go out of the program. And so um, we've had a very difficult time keeping that supply of raw donors. It's also that raw dogs don't poop as much as kibble dogs. And so that's just a reality, right? Um, and so yeah. m we were talking to Margo about this problem. She said, well, I can supply you from my dog. So about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, we started doing this. And she is now supplying us more and more material. And so, um, so but we still have some of our own raw donors. And so what we're going to do is start labeling the material that comes from her dogs that different from the material that we get from our own donors. And part of the reason is that um, her dogs aren't just raw, right? Raw fed. She has a whole um, like perspective on how you ought to care for a pet. And um, I forget the phrase. She has it like she's like a trademarked, trademarked, but it's about, you know, it's about um, 
uh, like what cleaners you have in the house. It's about not just what you feed, but um, also like what medications you give. And so there's, there's a whole, and also like how many generations has mm -hmm. this, this pet come from a, a, uh, uh, a lineage that's been naturally reared. And so um, like her dogs are like that. Most, I mean, most uh, animals in a city are going to be spayed, spayed and neutered. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not part of her, her ethos. And so, um, so yeah, we're going to label separately. Um, today, if you're buying the product from our, from a vet, uh, it will be Margot's product. And if you're buying it from our, um, dot com site, it will also be Margot's product. But, um, now that we have a, built up our donor base, we're going to separately label our, our own raw donors. And, um, and, you know, like it's more expensive to get the material from Margo. And there are a lot of people who are willing to pay for that, um, but there are a lot of people who aren't. So, um, so you know, we try and be pretty transparent about it. Um, Margo can be, uh, Dr. Roman can like to shock people. Um, and like she will tell people that her dogs are vegan. Um, but really what she means is that she's feeding a lot of vegetable material. They're not vegan, right? Um, That's so but funny she, because she <laughs> literally somebody messaged me on Instagram the other day and was like, well, what do you think about Dr. Margot Roman um, feeding her dogs a vegan diet? And I'm like, first of all, I have nothing to say about her. If she's doing it, that is all her. <laughs> yeah. And, but... and she's not, but she... she she sometimes says those things because she wants to challenge us all to really be conscious about what we're feeding our pets and how, I mean, she, you know, like there's a lot of resources that go into growing meat and like, do I need to eat as much meat as I do? Probably not. I like it, but that doesn't mean I need it. Right. And so I think part, she like will say these things, but like when you actually look at, I mean, she, she, I think on her site, she even goes into detail, like how she does, she makes her all of her own food and it's a lot of vegetable material, but it's not vegan. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind <laughs> of have this feeling like I get it. I get where certain people may just be so gung ho about, I want to make sure I'm getting the fecal matter from her dogs. Um, and, and probably generally those are going to be people who are like hardcore followers of hers and things like that. <laughs> but at the same time, I kind of, I have this feeling that it's like, you know, we have this ideal, like healthy gut microbiome in a dog. And if we can get, if, if this product gets us there, then doesn't matter what other dog. I mean, of course it matters. Like you have to do the, the, the research and making sure that what you're getting in is good. But like, if we're getting the strains of bacteria that we're supposed to be getting, then that isn't that why we're buying the product to begin with. Yeah, that's a really good question. And so our, all of our initial studies, um, where we showed that fecal transplants work and there are lots of other researchers that show that fecal transplants work. Um, none of them were done with Margot's dog's materials. Okay. And, and so it wasn't only like a year and a half ago where she was making it as readily available as she's making it now. And so, um, so yes, fecal transplants work, even if you're not buying the material from Margot's dogs, the best way I can describe it is that, um, I often buy organic foods. And I tr almost religiously try to buy organic foods, right? But I don't know that that organic tomato is really like more helpful than the non-organic one. But what I do know is that the process of raising that organic tomato is better for the environment than the process of raising the non-organic tomato. And so I think mm -hmm. that is that ethos can be applied to what you know, Margot's material, like she's raising her dogs in a way that we all want, think every dog should be raised. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're supporting a whole ethos more than necessarily that it's more effective. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And I appreciate that point of view. Um, I know that's how I try to 
keep my my household and my animals and me and pretty like i i just want to be like how natural can we get <laughs> right. without going crazy without being like i mean of course i can be that hypocritical person that's like you know oh i had i had minerals back to my water but i'm gonna go get my hair dye like yeah <laughs> I, I probably am right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean so, and, and so yeah. just so everyone's clear all the all the material that we use in our product meets the same rigorous standards in terms of parasites, pathogen, and microbiome composition. And so um, no matter where it comes from, that's like a hard and fast rule. And we test all of our donors at least monthly for those pathogen, parasites, and microbiome composition. And what we've seen is that often the microbiome starts to not look so good well before a pet gets diagnosed with cancer well before so so we believe that that's like a an early indicator of future health problems and so that's why we use that as a very strict measure um and and we're not going to compromise on that part of it um no matter where the the supply comes from perfect i think um you answered all my questions and hopefully you answered everyone's questions on um okay. I mean, I hate to say it this way, but honestly, like the integrity of, <laughs> of the company, because that's what really it boils down to and what people are talking about. And we can get in the weeds about it, but um, the bottom line, and I think you, you, what you've said is that we, we want to help all pets and how can we get there? And um, so that's, that's the whole point. Thank you so much for coming You're back welcome. and re-recording with me. I appreciate you. Sure. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think anyone who's, who has met me or Holly knows that we're just real people, but, you know, we're scientists. So like we will follow the data wherever it goes and we want everyone to uh, have access to that data. So where can people learn more? Where can they follow? We've got doggy biome. We've got kitty biome. It's all at animalbiome.com. Yeah, yeah, you can just go to animalbiome.com. Animal if you're a vet, it'll navigate you to animalbiome.vet. If you're a cat person, we've got a cat dedicated site and a dog person, a dog dedicated site. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the products, but so one of the other thing that's different about our supplements is that we really believe that supplements should be dosed for the right species and the right weight and so like cats have a much faster digestive tract than dogs whose digestive tract is faster than humans and so if you buy a human supplement and you give it to yourself to your dog and your cat it's all going to get processed differently right and so we have we're we have cat specific products that are um, we've taken pains to make sure they're dosed for their transit time um, and also for, for dogs. And so I think when you look at a lot of supplements, they say, okay, one, one capsule a day, no matter what size your dog is or cat is and, or age. And that's because they haven't really done the work to understand what is really going to make a different with your difference with your pet. So that's why we have these different sites because we really believe every type of species should have the right kind of advice to help them be healthy. Yes. Well, and it, it, it makes so much sense, of course. And, and spe especially with the, the fecal, um, transplant pills, right? Because right. It, it, the gut microbiome of a cat is going to be different than the gut microbiome of a dog, you know, just it, if nothing else, because a cat is an obligate carnivore and our That's dogs right. are, well, I guess it depends on who you ask faculty. Faculty, faculty, faculty. I don't even know the word. Faculty. faculty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, dogs are very flexible. They developed a way over time, a developed way to digest carbohydrates. That doesn't mean that they should be on high carbohydrate diets just because they right. can, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, they're much more flexible. They're much more like us. Um, we can eat carbohydrates, but if you eat Twinkies all day, that's not good for you. Right. Uh, so, really? um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, and then of course there's uh, always something going on. Um, I know I've seen 
Holly do a lot of lives and, yeah. uh, you know, on social media. So there's just, there's always something going on and, um, conferences. I know I, like I met you at super zoo, which is wonderful. And Holly will be at AHVMA, correct. And, um, mm -hmm. so there are ways to, to reach out and find out more information and please, 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 um, as a pet parent do talk to your veterinarian about the product, even if, you know, it's not specifically about the animal biome products, like about your pet's gut health. And okay. um, as, as Carlton was saying, microbiome medicine, because, you know, we just chase our tails by putting band-aids on symptoms. Like it's just not. That's right. That's right. And Jessica, one of the things I want to make sure your listeners know, and I don't know if, if this will be out before then, but, um, both Judy Morgan and Dr. Judy Morgan and um, and Odette and others will be at the um, the Thriving Pet Expo in Southern mm -hmm. California in September. And I know Dr. Judy Morgan also puts on um, uh, conferences and expos across the country. So if you really want to learn more about the microbiome, about basically caring for a healthy pet, um, I encourage you to get out there and go to one of these one of these conferences. For sure. I can make sure it gets out before Thriving Pet, um, which is in Newport Beach, California. Is that correct? It is. It is. Yes. Yeah. Um, at end of, I think it's September 30th and October 1st. So I'll make sure this episode mm -hmm. gets out before okay. then because it is a big one. It's a very big one. Um, sadly, I will not be there. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've seen Dr. Judy Morgan already this year. Um, I'm going to Feed Real, which is, I think, going to be really fun, too. Um, oh, great. Dr. Who is going to be there? Well, Rodney Habib will be there and um, oh, nice. Dr. Barbara Royal. So a few different faces at, at that yep. particular summit. But yeah, um, all of the, the events that these veterinarians do around the country throughout the year always, always great. Um, if you can catch them somewhere, cause they do try, except for Texas. I don't know what it is. I'm in Texas and nobody wants to come here. <laughs> well, we're like an so, island in the middle of the country. I know. <laughs> Are you familiar with the pet, the pet summits? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. The and so, summits. um, we're, yeah, we're going to be doing a, um, a program in the spring with Dr. Ruth Roberts and focusing on gut health. So that's something that even someone in the island of Texas could attend virtually. <laughs> Don't tell anybody about that. You know, I'm just kidding. Yes, um, I yes. do. I think that's in April-ish. I think so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, that's going to be very, very fun. And I actually have um, a surprise that I, I will be make sure y'all are subscribed. If you're not subscribed, you're following the podcast because um, there will be a lot of surprises coming up for that particular oh, pet nice. summit. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Yay. Yes, that's going to be fun. Well, Carlton, thank you so very much. Um, this was incredibly educational and I think giving, giving people a lot to think about, especially, you know, like you were saying, all of these gut issues, that IBD, IBS, um, skin issues that people yep. don't realize are gut issues <laughs> yep. and ear infections and swollen itchy paws. These are all gut issues. Autoimmune starts in the gut. If your vet is telling That's you right. that your pet has an autoimmune disease, we need to be looking at the gut. Like, I don't know what we don't need to be looking at the gut for. <laughs> really? It's true. It's true. Um, I think uh, the father of modern medicine um, was right when he said all disease starts in the gut. So, Yes. So thank you so much. And guys, make sure you You're are welcome. following Animal Biome, um, Doggy Biome, Kitty Biome, depending. I like to follow both. I have both cats and dogs. And yep. uh, if you have, like, if you have uh, tested your pet and you just are not finding the help you need with your veterinarian, um, check out Animal Biome's website for a vet finder. If you can't find somebody locally, maybe you can find somebody that does telemed. Um, mm -hmm. Or, uh, of course, we can always go to AHVMA, start there as well, or potentially look yep. for you know a pet health coach who can help you understand and interpret those, those results um, more specific to your animal, because these really can be like the key to unlocking how to help your pet heal themselves. So.
That's right. Thank you again, Carlton. I really appreciate you and everything that uh, you and Holly are doing. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. This has been great. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.